Well, I thought I covered all the executive cars from the 1970s in my last video, but as always, you're very knowledgeable and you spotted a few cars that I missed. If you haven't seen that video, I'd recommend you watch that first and there's a link above. I also said I wasn't going to talk about Jaguar because it was a little too premium in my opinion, but hey, while we're talking about other cars, why not throw that into the mix as well? This is all the cars I missed from the 1970s executive car story. NSU were a West German executive car maker and they released the innovative R080 in 1967. Like Citroen, they produced a highly aerodynamic car with an impressive 0.36 drag coefficient and like Citroen, it was a highly innovative car, the Cybertruck of its day. It had disc brakes on all four wheels and used a semi-automatic gearbox at a time when synchromesh wasn't a given on some cars. But the most innovative feature was its 113 horsepower Wankel rotary engine. Unsurprisingly, it won Car of the Year in 1968. But all of this innovation was NSU's undoing. The rotary engine was thirsty and unreliable, and most of the company's limited resources went into fixing the problems. Customers rejected the R080, leaving NSU on the rocks. They were purchased by the Volkswagen Audi Group in 1969, who continued to sell the R080 under the NSU badge, maybe so it didn't damage the Volkswagen or Audi brands. Sales didn't improve in its native Germany and were almost non-existent in the UK. Production ended in 1977, but as can be seen from this photo, they were still being registered in the UK as late as 1978. When NSU was acquired by Volkswagen, they had a new car almost ready for production. It was slightly smaller than the R080, but still large enough to be in the executive car category. In fact, it would go up against the Audi 100. VW also had their own large car, the 411, that had launched just two years previously. So both Volkswagen and Audi had new cars that were also sold in this space, so it was a little surplus to requirements. Given all of this, the launch, which happened around the time of the acquisition, got a little messy. The big reveal was announced, then it was cancelled. In the end, the NSU K70 was launched in 1969 and would go on sale in 1970, but not as an NSU. It would have a Volkswagen badge and would be their first front-engined, front-wheel drive car. Rather than a rotary engine and semi-automatic gearbox, the K70 wisely stuck with a conventional four-cylinder engine and transmission from NSU's parts bin. It would become Volkswagen's largest car and at the top of their range even when the Passat replaced the 411 in 1973, but production of the K70 ended in 1975. In my last video, I talked about Ford's and GM's cars, but missed out on Chrysler, the Peggy Schuyler of the American automotive big three. Work, work, Angelica, work, work, Eliza and Peggy. Chrysler had purchased a controlling stake in the British Roots Group in 1967. Roots' largest car was the Scepter, and by 1970, the third generation had been on sale for three years. The Scepter was the top-of-the-line version of the Hillman Hunter, and was also a little cramped compared to other executive cars on sale. There would be an estate version in 1974, but sales were never that impressive, and when it ended production in 1976, the Humber name was retired with it. Chrysler also owned Simca in France, who had the 1501. Like the Scepter, it was a little small, but also lacked executive power with just a one and a half litre engine. What Chrysler needed was a true executive car that they could sell across Europe. Both Roots and Simca were separately working on different versions of what that car might be. Chrysler shut down the French proposal and both companies worked on refining the British design that would launch as the Chrysler 180 in 1970. 
Designed by Roy Axe, who would go on to oversee the design of the Rover 800 Executive Saloon 20 years later, it followed the American-inspired design language of the time and looked like a larger version of the Hillman Adventure that launched the same year. The 1.8 litre Chrysler 180 was produced in France and available to buy in the UK in 1971, with a 2 litre version in 1973. The press reaction wasn't terrible, but it was damned by faint praise. It didn't help that reviewers put it up against cars like the all-conquering but much smaller Ford Cortina, rather than more natural competition like the Zodiac. Chrysler's marketing team also fell flat. They failed to make much of an advertising push, something of a problem as the Chrysler name wasn't familiar in European markets. The car itself lacked some of the prestige features found on the competition like central locking and electric windows. It was a car to easily overlook when comparison shopping, and when you did, it was forgettable. The 180 settled down to just 2,000 sales per year, hardly something that would recoup the investment cost. It sold even worse in France. Production moved to Spain where it had modest success with the option of a diesel engine. Chrysler had attempted to import luxury cars produced in Australia. The Chrysler Valiant was shown at the 1966 British Motor Show, but it was expensive, about the same as an entry-level Jaguar, and didn't meet with much interest. Chrysler persevered though. By 1970 they were offering the VG version, and the next year the newer VH Valiant was introduced. But they were still expensive compared to the competition, especially given their level of trim. And like the 180, Chrysler didn't market them very well. They were selling enough of them in the UK though that the new Valiant made its appearance for the 1974 model year. The Valiant had a thirsty range of engines though, topping out at a 5 litre V8, and sales, even before the oil crisis, weren't great, so imports ended in 1975. Chrysler were also attempting to go the other way, exporting British cars to Australia. A version of the Chrysler 180 made it to Australia as the Chrysler Centura in 1975. Another car from the previous video I made, the Vauxhall Viceroy, also came to Australia as the 1978 Holden Commodore. Although Ford didn't bring the Granada to Australian shores, the second generation car was used as a template for the 1979 Ford Falcon. Japanese cars were making a strong push into export markets in 1970. Unlike its competitors in Detroit, they weren't making many design compromises for each local market. They pretty much shipped the same car all around the world and sold it as is. This meant the style took some getting used to. They had a different look both inside and out. However, by 1970, Japan was producing some large executive cars for the local market, and these were brought to the UK. Some notable cars that are a little too small for this list are the Mitsubishi Sigma Galant that was certainly being sold in the UK in the late 1970s. Mazda introduced the loose luxury saloon and estate that had first been produced in 1966, and by 1973 the updated version was being called the Mazda 929. Another update arrived in 1977, and each generation of this car had included the option of a Wankel rotary engine like the NSU R080, but Mazda were having a bit more success with it. Nissan launched the third generation Cedric in 1971, and this was sold in the UK as the Datsun 240C. In some countries it was well appointed with electric windows and mirrors, an automatic gearbox and air conditioning but not the British version. The best Datsun's brochure could call out was the radio with auto-seek and electric aerial plus metallic paint. But you can tell it was the 1970s. It included four ashtrays and two cigar lighters, one in the front and one in the back, perfect for the kids to play with. It did have a reasonably powerful 2.4 litre, 130 horsepower engine that would soon be updated to a 2.6 litre but it didn't sell well in the UK. Customers there were just getting their heads around Japanese cars, and they would start to be known fairly or unfairly as cheap rust buckets. It's hard to sell a high-end executive saloon under those conditions. By 1974, Datsun was still selling the saloon, but were focusing on the estate. It traded less on luxury and more on practicality seating seven people. 
The 260C would be updated in 1975 with the fourth generation model that continued the American styling both inside and out. It now got power steering and braking and an optional automatic gearbox. The estate had a unique feature, an electrically operated rear side window to load things into the boot from the side. Another update appeared in 1979 and it was now sold as the 280C as it had a larger 2.8 litre six cylinder engine. But although Brits experimented with the Datsun, Cherry, Sunny and Bluebird, very few of its large saloons or estates were sold. The Datsun 260C's main competitor in Japan was the Toyota Crown, which also made it to the UK around 1971, but maybe not by aeroplane. Like the Datsun, it was available as both a saloon and an estate with a 2.6 litre engine that had more power than the 260C, but also the same top speed. Also like the Datsun, it was a mecca for smokers with front and rear cigarette lighters and a felt lined holder for your cigarette box. It offered a few more features than the Datsun as well, automatic transmission, power steering, central locking, a remote electronic boot release and an aerial built into the windscreen. The Crown 2600 Special Saloon, the highest spec, included air conditioning, a rare luxury for a UK spec car, as well as a cold box in the boot. In the days before cassettes caught on, Toyota offered an 8-track player to go with the AM FM radio. This being the early 1970s, safety wasn't a high priority. Toyota called out head restraints on the front seats to prevent whiplash, but surprisingly seat belts weren't a standard feature on this luxury car. But then if you're doing all that smoking, a long life may not be high on your priority list. There would be an update in 1974 and another in 1979, but like the Datsun, the style would remain American, which might work in North America, but didn't suit European tastes. German cars had styling that Brits wanted and Japanese cars continued to be dismissed as down market. Japanese cars certainly didn't have the credibility for my father. He'd found Audi and was happy with the product they made and didn't feel a need to switch. He also never considered Jaguar, probably because of the high price. By 1970 they'd been rolled into British Leyland and really only had two models on sale. There was the E-Type of course, but as far as executive cars went, there was the 420G, a renamed Mark 10, but it was in its last year of production. Jaguar's main executive saloon now was the XJ6 that was only two years old, but this was a very large and very expensive luxury saloon, a lot more than almost all of the cars I've talked about so far. Jaguar had until recently made smaller executive cars. They launched the Mark II in 1959, that had been replaced with the S-Type four years later. But sales of the S-Type had disappointed and in fact the Mark II that remained in production outsold it in some years. There was also a high-end version launched as the Jaguar 420 and the Daimler Sovereign. Given the age of the Mark II and the lack of interest in the S-Type, production of all these cars had ended in 1969, meaning all hopes for future Jaguar sales in the 1970s rested on the shoulders of that very large, very expensive XJ6. Those hopes weren't misguided. The XJ6 was a good car with a 2.8 litre straight six, allowing it to soak up the miles on the new web of motorways crisscrossing the country. There was an upmarket version sold as the next generation Daimler Sovereign. High-end features like air conditioning and automatic transmission were available with the usual Jaguar leather seats. It got better in 1972 with a V12 engine, the only saloon car in the world offering one at the time. That was good enough to get it to 140 miles an hour. A year later, the XJ was given a facelift as the Series 2, at a time when Toyota were making seatbelts an optional extra on their luxury car, it's interesting that the new Jaguar featured side impact protection in the doors, something of a rarity at the time. It would take another six years for the Series 3 to arrive, and when it did, it was just another facelift. Parent British Leyland had gone bankrupt in 1975, and what little money Jaguar possessed had gone into launching the replacement for the E-Type, the Jaguar XJS. The XJ was now over 10 years old and there wasn't much to the Series 3 facelift. It's easy to see that from the 20 page brochure that they launched. The first 10 pages are spent waxing lyrically 
about the new power sunroof. In 1973, Jaguar's American XJ6 brochure called it one of the most highly engineered, sophisticated luxury sedans ever to come across the seas to America. But with little development, by the end of the decade, it was getting hard to say this with a straight face. Jaguar's financial starvation meant the XJ stagnated and it was being built on outdated equipment. They would try to lean into this by highlighting the hand-built nature of the car, but their German rivals were moving ahead. In 1979, this was a concern, but throughout the 1980s, the alarm bells would get louder and louder until something had to give. But that is a story for another day. You may want to take a look at the Princess or Saab 900 videos on the right, both cars I talked about in the first video. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next video.